Okay, let's talk now about circular polarization. Let me just begin by showing you a pictorial diagram of what circular polarization looks like. Uh, the diagram on the top is what you want to focus on. This represents a propagating electromagnetic wave. It's still a uniform plane wave in the sense that uh, if I look at the propagation direction, if I take a plane that's perpendicular to the direction of propagation, nothing changes within that plane. So we're not dropping that assumption of the uniform plane wave, but we are changing the assumption that the electric field is always pointed in the same direction. And so the red line right there is an example of what the electric field might look like if we freeze time for just a second uh, and look at what things look like. And the red line basically forms this helix shape and the helix shape is spinning around uh, in a circular pattern. And if we were to then press play after freezing time, you, what you would see is this entire helix shape moving to the side, right? It's, sli it's sliding to the right. It's not unfurling, but the whole thing is moving to the right. And that would be what we call circular polarization. Now, the bottom part of this diagram is basically the projection of circular polarization onto the x-axis. And what you see is if you look just at the x component of the electric field, shown in red, you see what looks like a linear polarization, right? There's, no, there, there's nothing that distinguishes this from ordinary linear polarization. There's a sine wave, and this whole sine wave is just gonna slide in a positive direction, in the propagation direction. But let's take a look at what this is mathematically, because as it turns out, circular polarization is really just a sum of two linear polarization. We're gonna to have to throw a little extra in there. So let's consider first two different linear polarizations with orthogonal linearizations or polarization with respect to each other. So the first one, we're gonna take the electric field as a phasor to be equal to the electric field at the origin as a phasor times E to the minus J beta z in the x direction. This represents a linearly polarized uniform plane wave moving in the positive z direction. It's x oriented, right? It's, uh, it's polarized in the x direction linearly. And now I'm gonna give you a second one that is polarized in the y direction. Right, I'll call this E1 and I'll call this E2. If this is E02, a phasor, times e to the minus j beta z in the y direction, right? So both of these, again, have positive z hat propagation, but this one has x hat polarization. And this one also has the same positive z hat propagation and y hat polarization. Now, because these are propagating in the same direction, we can basically assume that they can coexist, right? We can superimpose them on top of each other to create a single wave that's moving in the positive Z direction. But before I do that, I'm gonna throw in one more thing, which is I'm going to multiply the lower linear polarization by J and add a J to that. And what that J is going to do is it's going to shift the phase of the lower wave, number two, by 90 degrees. If we look at this pictorially, what we're gonna see is the following. Wave number one will look like this, All right? This will be number one. Number two is going to be advanced by 90 degrees. And so I'm gonna to try to draw this as best I can, but it's just gonna be offset by 90 degrees. This would be number two, All right? That's what that J does. It's going to shift the phaser by 90 degrees. So we have now a phase shift between the X-directed and the Y-directed magnetic field. All right, and so let's look at this first in a time domain and then envision what this would look like um, in terms of phasers. And right, so first, let's look at number one. All right, so number one um, will basically have a, um, a cosine of omega t to it. So let's look at the value of ex at z equals zero. 
All right, so we're going to set it equal to zero. This term right here disappears. And E01, let's just say it's uh, it's got a phase of, of one to it. All right, or, or it's, it's got a phase of zero. So we're just going to see a cosine of omega t associated with that. All right, that is the electric field as a function of time for number one. For number two, we're going to see the same thing, except we're going to have to throw in that 90 degree phase shift. All right, so we're going to have something that looks like this. It's going to start out at zero and go negative. It's the same sinusoidal shape, but it just leads number one by 90 degrees. All right, this is the electric field at z equals zero in the y direction. All right, so let's now take this shape right here where the x uh, component of the electric field is a cosine and the y component of the electric field is a negative sign. And let's combine that and plot what things look like in the xy plane. And what you'll find is this. You'll find that at t equals zero, and this is, uh, let me label these axes, this is the x direction and this is the y direction. So basically we're looking at the wave um, as the wave is coming at you and the xy plane is perpendicular to us. So the wave is coming out of the board toward you. And at t equals zero, we have a big x component of the electric field and we have no y component, which means that at t equals zero, this is the electric field. All right, and remember this is not a phaser anymore. We're shifting us into the time domain. Right at t equals zero, we have only an s component and no y component. As time increases, the x component of the electric field starts to decrease, and the y component acquires a negative value. What ends up happening is that this phaser here is going to start to rotate with time. And so, if we wait a little while, it's eventually going to be here. Right. This is the electric field. You know what, let me just draw this at a 90 degree angle. If we wait by one fourth of a period or a quarter of a cycle, then this will be the electric field at T equals a quarter period, where period is one over the frequency. And this is gonna keep rotating around in a circle, right? And the way we have done that is we have two linearly polarized waves and we put a 90 degree phase shift between them. And that's basically give us, given a circular rotation of the electric field. This is called a circularly polarized wave. So at any given moment, there's always an electric field that actually stays constant. It just rotates around. And if we go back to the diagram, we can see that that's basically what's happening. This, the, um, if, if you imagine standing in one position right here, you're standing at one spot, and now you take this entire red helix and it's all sliding to the right, and you're measuring the electric field where you're standing, it's gonna rotate in a circle. And that is circular polarization. Now with circular polarization, it turns out that there are two different types of circular polarization because the electric field can rotate clockwise or counterclockwise. So let me just define those. The first is if the electric field is equal to E zero times E to the minus J beta Z times X hat minus j times y hat. If we do that and plot again this xy coordinate system, what we're going to see is that the electric field starts over here. Let me label these axes, x and y. The electric field starts over here and then it's going to rotate in the counterclockwise direction. All right, this is the rotation as t grows. And the blue is going to spin around f times per second. f is a frequency. It can spin around f times per second. This is called a right-hand circularly polarized wave. All 
Now we can do the same thing, except we can flip the sign of that J right there, right? So this is one type of polarization. And let's look at the exact opposite, which is when the electric field is gonna have our E to the minus J theta Z, and we're gonna have an X hat plus J times Y hat. Again, this is two different waves summed up, one with an X polarization and one with the Y polarization, but we're putting a 90 degree phase shift in between it by shoving that J in there. If we look at that, then we're gonna start out with an electric field that's pointed in the X direction at T equals zero. Except the rotation is going to be in the opposite direction. It's gonna be rotating this way, right? This is the rotation as T grows. And this is called left-hand circular polarization. Now let me explain for a second why these are called left-hand and right-hand circular polarizations. And again, this is gonna come back to the right-hand rule. Unfortunately, people are going to define it differently, but I'll explain both. Here we go. Um, if you look at the left plot, the right-hand circular polarization, take your right hand and point your thumb in the direction of propagation. In this case, the direction of propagation is positive Z. Positive Z is out of the board. So point your thumb in the direction coming out of the board. If you do that, your fingers will curl in the direction that the elect electric field is rotating, which on the screen is going to be counterclockwise. So for that reason, it's called right-hand circular polarization. Again, point your thumb in the direction of propagation. Left-hand circular polarization is the opposite. You can take your left hand, take your thumb and point it in the direction of propagation, which is coming out of the board, and your fingers will then curl in the direction that the electric field rotates. That is called left-hand circular polarization. Now here's the tricky part. Um, these conventions are switched depending on who you're talking to. Um, what I just described is the IEEE convention, right? IEEE is the Institute of Elec Electrical and Electronic Engineers. It's sort of the scientific and professional society for double E's. Um, and they have long had this standard that right hand and left hand correspond the way I've drawn it, where your thumb is pointing in the direction of um, propagation. However, if you go ask someone either in the physics or the optics community, then they have a different way of looking at the problem. Neither one is right, it's just convention. In the optics and physics community, it will do the exact opposite. So the thinking there is if you're standing somewhere and you have a wave coming at you and you point your thumb toward it as it's coming at you, then your fingers are going to rotate in a proper direction. So in this case, on the left, uh, the left-hand plot, which is right-hand circular polarization, the optics person would point their thumb toward that wave which is coming at you, and now your fingers are going to curl. Uh, and so since you have to you use your left hand do that properly with the left plot the optics people would call could I color code this the optics people will call this left hand and they will call that right hand circular polarization All right so just be aware of which one uh, it is um, you know as you attack it All right so this is a uh, um, this is circular polarization and what's important is that once this polarization is established then you have a circular rotation of the electric field. And as part of that circular rotation, the strength of the electric field is the same anywhere around the circle. That's the definition of circular polarization. But that does not always have to be the case. For example, let me give you a modification of the uh, right-hand circular polarization. And what if we did this, E equals, E zero times E to the minus J beta Z. Again, we're just representing the propagation. And now I'm gonna write twice times the X direction minus J in the Y direction. So this is the same circular polarization as before, but basically we no longer have an equal balance between the two linear polarizations. We're saying that the X directed wave is twice as big as the Y directed wave. 
If we do that, and then we plot the electric field as a function of time, and again, this is the x-axis, and here is the y-axis. If we plot this, we're gonna get something that looks like this. Um, at t equals zero, this wave comes all the way out. And if you trace this, it's gonna end up making an ellipse where this value is two and this value is one. And this will be the circle, or sorry, the ellipse that this electric field is going to traverse, right? It's no longer a nice even circle, we're stretching it out. And so because it's tracing out an ellipse, this is called unsurprisingly elliptical polarization. And in particular, we can still say that this is right-hand elliptical polarization. Since there is still a sense to the orientation, right? It has a circular component to it. And so we call this right-hand elliptical polarization. The opposite would be true. You can also have left-hand elliptical polarization. But notice that we can even break this down further. Right-hand elliptical polarization can be written as a sum of two things. First, slide this over. First will be a circularly polarized wave. Right, x hat minus j times y hat. And number two, I'm gonna put another linearly polarized wave. And it's just gonna be x hat plus nothing in the y direction. Right, so this is gone. You'll notice that this uh, elliptically polarized wave equals the sum of these two, right? It's the sum of number one and number two. So a elliptically polarized wave can be thought of as a summation of a linear polarized wave and a circularly polarized wave. And we can just see that directly mathematically. Same is true for right hand or left hand, it still applies. If we do that, uh, then we can uh, describe the way in which an elliptical polarization is kind of close to linear or close to circular. There's basically a continuum in between it. And so the way this is often done is to define something called a major axis and a minor axis. The major axis, uh, and what I'm drawing is called the semi-major axis. This is called the semi-major. It's the length of the longer half of the ellipse. And the shorter side is gonna be called the semi-minor axis. In a circularly polarized wave, semi-minor and semi-major are the same. In a linearly polarized wave, you have only semi-minor and no semi, uh, you have, sorry, you have only semi-major and no semi-minor because that ellipse collapses into a single line. Um, and so we can define something called the ellipticity And so if the semi-major is defined as A and the semi-minor is defined as B, then the ellipticity is the square root of one minus B squared over, well, B, one minus B over A squared, like this. Let me write that better. one minus b over a squared. This is called the ellipticity. The ellipticity basically tells us where you are on a continuous spectrum between linear and um, circularly polarized. So E equals zero for circular polarization. Since for circular polarization, B equals A, and one minus one is zero, and so this becomes zero, and E equals one for linear polarization. So you can think of the ellipticity as being like the degree of linearness 
of the polarization of a wave. And this is sometimes called the ellipticity or sometimes called the eccentricity. Right, so this is called the uh, eccentricity. It's a degree of linear polarization or to what extent a circle is stretched, all right? Uh, so what we're gonna do now is we're gonna talk in the next video about a few ways in which um, polarization appears in nature and in science and engineering.